A couple looking for their first home together finds one that's perfect and cheaper than what is currently on the market. It's a little worse for wear, but with a little TLC, it would be a home they could raise a family in. That's the start to most horror movies you'll see nowadays, but somehow not too far-fetched, right? My girlfriend, Sarah and I were that couple. We are young, in love, and wanted to live together so badly that we gathered up what little money we had to find our own place. Honestly, I was content with an apartment in the middle of town, but she convinced me that a mortgage would be cheaper and assured me that it would be worth it in the long run. I wanted to rip my hair out as we searched for a house that we wanted within our price range. Everything was so ridiculously overpriced that we almost gave up until we got a phone call from my mom. She had heard from a friend of a friend who knew someone that was putting their house up for sale. We called the number that she had texted us and we talked to the previous owner, Joseph. On the phone, we were met with a jovial husky voice of a man who told us that the house had originally belonged to his uncle. Joseph's uncle had left the house to him, but he had no need for it and wanted to sell it. Sarah and I were trying to contain our excitement when he told us how much he wanted for the home, so we quickly made arrangements to check the house out before we made any deals. The following morning, we went to the address he had sent us. The house was in a rural area about 30 minutes away from town, and when we got there, we were in awe. It was so picturesque with this long gravel driveway that led us to the beautiful faded white farmhouse. To be honest, I was still in shock at the price Joseph had set. This was a lot of house and land. There had to be something wrong with it, right? When we reached the house, there was a small red truck parked at the end of the driveway. A burly man dressed in jeans and a red flannel shirt stood at the front steps looking up towards the house. We got out of our car and we called out a greeting to him, but he didn't break his gaze until we got a couple of steps away from him. He turned to look at us and shook his head a bit, as if he was shaking himself from a trance. Oh, sorry about that. Haven't had my coffee yet, he said as he turned to face us, flashing us a cheerful grin. So, what do you think? Quite a beauty, eh? Oh, it's so cute, Sarah answered as she stepped beside me. I let out an awkward chuckle as I responded. Yeah, it's almost too good to be true. Joseph looked at the both of us, then back towards the house. Yeah, well, it'll be a shame to let such a good house go to waste, and I know how hard it is to get a house these days. Anyway, come on, let me show you around. We followed him up the couple of steps and through the front door. He gave us a bit of the history as he showed us around the house. It was built in the mid-80s by the family of his uncle's wife. They moved in after they married to take care of her parents up until they had passed. They stuck around, didn't have a family of their own, and Joseph told me they'd both also died here. I turned to look at my wife to see she was as pale as a sheet. So... People have died here, Sarah said in a low voice. Joseph's smiling face suddenly dropped as she asked the question. He forced a smile and asked, Oh, is that a problem? Before she could respond, I cut in with a sharp, Oh, no, not at all. Her face looked up at me with a mix of shock and anger as she grabbed my arm to pull me to the side. Are you serious right now? She shouted at me under her breath. I wanted to say that she was overreacting, but I didn't want to dig my own grave. So I responded as calmly as I could. Listen, babe, we've been searching for months and this... This is the best deal we could possibly get. Sarah's face turned to full anger and I braced myself for impact. We excused ourselves from Joseph for about 10 minutes as we walked outside to weigh our options. Ultimately, we decided to go on with the tour and decide from there. We went back inside the home and looked around to find Joseph, but we couldn't find him. We figured he must have gone upstairs, so we went up to look around the few bedrooms and still no trace of him. 
At this point, we had given ourselves our own tour. That's when we stepped into the kitchen to find a door that led down to a basement. He had to be down here. The lights were on. So, with Sarah behind me, we cautiously made our way down to the basement. Each of our steps caused the old wood underneath to creak so loudly, it was as if they were screaming as we made our way down. When we finally made it to the bottom, we turned to find Joseph standing in the center of the empty basement, staring at a dirty wall. I slowly stepped behind him, calling out to him as I got closer, but he didn't respond. I took a hand and placed it upon his left shoulder to grab his attention. Hey man, are you okay? I asked warily. Again, he jolted out of a trance and looked back at me. Oh sorry, I was doing some math in my head. I found a bit of water damage on the walls here, so I was going to take it off my asking price for you. I looked at the wall, and sure enough, there was some discoloration on the pale white surface. It didn't look like mold. I'm not sure how else to explain it, aside from faint black splotches of... ink? I looked back to Joseph, and he offered to continue the rest of the tour of the home. Sarah seemed a bit more reluctant, but we agreed, and he continued showing us the rest of the home. The only thing that felt off was Joseph's odd behaviour. Every now and then, his words would trail off as he shifted his attention towards the walls. The three of us walked outside, and Joseph turned to us. So, what do you think? Sarah looked at him, then looked at me. Well, honestly, the fact that a few people died here is a bit... unsettling. Joseph's grin quickly shifted into a frown. Oh, I can assure you, this old place is worth a buy. On that note, let me change up the offer a bit. Our jaws nearly dropped when he told us the much, much cheaper price than we first talked about. He told us that he noticed this place would definitely be a fixer-upper and that he'd be more than happy to know that his place would be going to good hands. Sarah and I talked a bit. With our budget and the price of the house, we'd be saving so much money. I shook Joseph's hand and we quickly got the paperwork situated. A couple of weeks later, everything we owned was packed into a moving truck and we headed towards our new home. We didn't have much, so Sarah and I did everything by ourselves. We were so excited to finally move in that maybe that gave us strength. Thanks to all the money we saved from Joseph's generous offer, we were able to get some furniture delivered, but that was going to take a bit longer, so all we had was my mattress. We decided to drop off all our boxes into the living room, then decide where everything goes afterwards. As I was placing a box down, I couldn't help but notice something on the wall. I stopped Sarah as she dropped off a box behind me. Hey, are you seeing what I'm seeing? I asked as I pointed at the wall in the living room. She followed the direction of my finger and saw that on the wall, what looked like a very faint black stain that looked eerily similar to a face. I stepped closer to the wall and sure enough, there was what looked like the outlines of a head. Long hair that stretched like tentacles, two beady eyes and pursed lips. I know that the human eye tries to find shapes and things, but this was uncanny. I placed my hand upon the image of the wall. I felt a cold sting underneath my fingertips. Sarah let out a little chuckle. Fix her up alright, we'll paint over it or something. Yeah, absolutely, I said, as I felt a wave of unease as I stared at the stain on the wall. It looked as though the face, or what looked like a face, its eyes were staring at me. We continued the rest of the day, unpacking and putting things in their new spots. It goes without saying that we were completely exhausted. That afternoon, we went back to town to grab dinner. We raised our glasses to a job well done, and chow down on some food. I tried to shake this feeling of unease, but in my mind, 
I kept remembering that damn stain on the wall. That face. It was around 8 o'clock when we finally returned to the house to see that the front door was wide open and all the lights were on. I told Sarah to call the cops and I rushed inside the house to see if there was an intruder. I looked through every inch of the house. Nothing seemed out of place and I didn't find anyone at all. I went down the stairs into the basement and I froze in place as I looked on the wall. The stains on the wall. There were now faces. About six of them now formed onto the wall of the basement that Joseph was staring at. Despite being a faint outline, I can make out the same feature on each one. All of them were staring at me and each one of them had their mouths open in a silent scream. Honey, Sarah called out to me from upstairs and I heard another set of footsteps with hers. I went back upstairs to see Sarah with a police officer. She looked at me with tears in her eyes and told me that I'd been gone for so long that she and the officer looked around for me. The police officer stuck around for a while as I told him what happened and that despite what we found, nothing seemed to be stolen. He assured us to call him if anything came up and told us to have a good night. After that scare, a good night was the last thing we would have. Sarah was upstairs taking a shower and I sat on the floor of the unfurnished living room staring at the walls. The face that I'd seen earlier there was now gone. I didn't tell Sarah about the faces I'd seen. I'm sure I was just tired from all the moving. I even went back to the basement and sure enough there weren't any faces on the walls. I laughed to myself and went upstairs to the master bedroom. I saw Sarah standing in the bathroom with a towel wrapped around her. I tried to be cool and walked towards her, wrapping my arms around her, when I noticed that she was shaking. I spun her around and saw her eyes were wide with absolute terror. I asked her what happened and after a couple of minutes she told me that while she was taking a shower, she felt someone was watching her. She thought that it was me, but when she turned around, she didn't see anything. She dropped a towel to show me where she felt something grab her, and on the midsection of her back, there was a faint black outline of her hand. Sarah asked if I saw anything, and I did my best to assure her that things would be okay, and that we must be really tired. She reluctantly agreed. Maybe we'd feel better in the morning after a good night's sleep. I gave her a hug and I looked behind her into the bathroom. And I saw another face staring back at me. But it was smiling. In my sleep, I dreamt that I was laying atop the mattress when I started to feel cold. I looked down to see the outlines of hands within the darkness of my bedroom wrapping their fingers around me, each bony finger pressing into my skin, squeezing me. My legs, arms, torso and throat are gripped by the countless cold hands. I forced my neck to turn towards Sarah, but the icy grips that were on me forced my head to look up towards the ceiling. Cold fingers pry my eyes open to see. On the ceiling, staring down at me, were so many faces no longer outlines, they were so vivid. Each face with a different pain expression on them, with one man's face looking down at me with a smile. I awoke the next morning. My body was shivering as I lifted myself up from the mattress. I looked over to Sarah, who was still fast asleep. I tried to take in the tranquil sight of her, resting, until I looked around the room. It was as if someone had covered their hands in black powder and pressed their hands all around the walls. Handprints of all sizes, pitch black, sprawling across every corner of the bedroom. I looked back up towards the ceiling to see that it was completely covered with the dark outlines of screaming faces. I shook Sarah awake. I couldn't keep this to myself any longer. And when she opened her eyes, 
I told her about the faces I had been seeing. Her face turned into such a pained look as she told me to look around the room. The walls were completely empty. I went to the nearest hardware store and bought so much white paint. As soon as I got back to the house, I picked up a roller and started frantically painting the walls. We spent days painting the entire inside of the house. But those damn stains, those damn faces kept coming back. Every night that I slept, I'd have the same dream of cold hands gripping onto me. Lately, I've been hearing something. Whispers coming from the walls, telling me to stay in the house, to be with the house. Have I finally gone crazy? Sarah suggested that we move out, but we had put so much money into this, and I refused to let whatever this is to keep coming back. I am not going to let go of this house. It's mine, right? Sarah is telling me that she's afraid, but she doesn't understand that I'm afraid too. I see them everywhere. They're constantly watching us. And I'm more afraid of what happens to us if they hear us talking about leaving. <laughs>